Wang, uh, and Average Fan, uh, uh, Li Yu, and myself are the main uh, uh, persons. I won't go over the abstract here. I'll try to launch into what this is all about. Uh, uh, I also want to say I was funded by the NSF, of course, obviously, and some good friends of mine. Uh, none of them will have any responsibility for this insane project. So everything I know about evolution has been from uh, Sewell Wright, but I'm not going to try to explain this landscape picture because it's a waste of time, I think. But the basic idea is that organisms actually move over landscapes of stress, and that plays a major role in the, um, uh, the way evolution proceeds forwards. Also, the number of individuals. So we'll leave it at that. Uh, so Li Yu, who's a former postdoc of mine now at Chongqing uh, University, decided to make an analog system of robots moving over fitness landscapes, uh, which would simulate rights evolution dynamics. Uh, and we call these robots Jeeps. Uh, and they're not Jeeps from MASH. That's not where the name comes from. Uh, it comes actually from Popeye the Sailor Man. You may not know that, but the guy who wrote Popeye was quite smart back in the 20s. He knew about Einstein, and he posited there are these uh, animals called Jeeps, and that's the noise they make. Jeep, Jeep, uh, and they're able to move between different landscapes, it turns out. Uh, they can go to the fourth dimension in this case here. So that's a cartoon, but I'll let it go because of the time. Anyways, that's a Jeep. So what, what we ended up building were these things. They're robots. Uh, they're circular things. They're about uh, three centimeters in diameter. Uh, and the great idea that um, uh, Li Yu came up with was that the Jeeps have uh, cameras underneath them, RGB sensors actually, for them. Uh, and they're on top of a giant LED light board, which is about four meters by four meters. And we can make any light pattern we want on this uh, LED light board. And so the Jeeps move over this LED light board and they are sensitive to R, G, or B, or any combination of them. And a particular fitness landscape could be, say, green. And as you vary the green intensity, more green means more uh, resources and less green means less resources. So they look at the color and they decide to try to move towards where the color is brightest for that particular one. These Jeeps have three genes, a red green, a red gene, a green gene, and a blue gene. And the number of bits that are on in that gene determines their sensitivity to the color. Uh, and that can be mutated. So the RGB genes can actually mutate uh, depending upon where they are. The more uh, less light they have, the more their mutation rate goes up. The more resources they have, the more their mutation rate goes down. So they mutate, they communicate with one another, as you'll see, and they also use resources. So when they're on top, say a green gene is on on a particular robot, if he sits over the green, he's using resources. The green light actually becomes less intense. They sense the gradient. They're always trying to move up the gradient to more things. But the movement is determined by their resource uh, usage, if that makes some sense. So that's this fitness landscape. In principle, we get 10 to the 7 different landscapes. Uh, they move uh, by mutations or by gene exchange. They have sex. We, uh, of course, built that in. You'll see why we have sex for these Jeeps also. Um, as I mentioned, unlike uh, Wright's uh, article, there are, these actually change the landscape. So they're like massive, uh, we call this warp drive. In other words, when they sit over a color and they actually consume that color, creating a shadow, they sense that and then they try to move towards uh, a place where it's brighter. So their motion is actually determined by how rapidly they consume resources. Uh, so they work on the gradient of the, of the, of the uh, resource. Uh, that's the warp drive that they have. Um, and so just a, just a nut, uh, 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 small thing of what's going on here. In the upper right hand, uh, upper left hand corner, here's a resource landscape of various colors. Uh, suppose we only have three colors, in this case here, RGB. Uh, they sense all three colors. The genes are, are determining how sensitive they are and how much actually they consume that resource. Um, the mutation rate which happens is proportional to inversely proportional to the color intensity. So we have a mutation going on. Um, so they can adapt. They can actually do, uh, they have sex. So if two of them get together, they can actually exchange genes. 
uh, and that's a possibility. And we have the usual hybrid, hybridization kind of thing going on. So we're trying to simulate as much as we can uh, the way a living or set of living organisms would actually be moving, mutating, and adapting onto a landscape. And the landscape obviously can be dynamic. We can change uh, the colors of the uh, thing and make it move around. So that's the basic idea that we came up with. Um, okay. Uh, anyway, so, so we, I, I've already said this, uh, and breeding is strictly local, by the way. Two of them have to come in contact with one. They can die. Um, so they actually can die if they, if they use, if they don't, if they uh, get into a bad place and their resource consumption rate is too high, then they go quiescent and they just sit there. Uh, but they can do transfiguration as in the Bible, at least the New Testament, I guess. Uh, in other words, two other Jeeps that are alive can go there, transfer their genes to them and make a dead one come back alive. So we have transfiguration in this system too. Uh, so this is sort of a schematic of what's going on here. They, they interact with one another. They change the landscape as in general relativity, this warp drive movement. They can have uh, death, they can be rebirthed, uh, and uh, they have mutations. So it's trying to simulate as much as we can uh, what a living uh, uh, complex set of communities would like, although obviously a lot more we're gonna add on to this. So I think I'm gonna show you a very quick movie here. Yeah, so this is done in Chongqing. Uh, of course, I'm on fundable, but they have lots of money in China. So uh, they can put a lot of people on this. So once we got this idea, had a lot of Chinese grad students that were launched into making these things. We have over 100 Jeeps that are constructed now. That's what they look like. And I think we're gonna switch over. You'll see the LED light board. There we go. That's the Chinese name for Chongqing. That's the Japanese Peace Memorial, by the way. And we'll turn them on here and they're gonna start moving. Here they're just randomly moving because it's just a, a uniform thing. You get the idea. And there's a landscape being generated and they're gonna start moving towards that landscape. Okay. So what kind of experiments can you do with this sort of thing? Well, we can do a number of things. We can do soft condensed matter things. I'll show you that in a second. Obviously, we're going towards evolution and adaptation uh, in uh, various kinds of uh, uh, landscapes. I'm not gonna talk about a uh, robot model for cancer invasion, but we're actually working on that. And then the last thing I'm gonna talk about is emergence of collective intelligence in this system, if that's possible. So, okay, so let's do the easy part, the linear stuff. First is soft condensed matter uh, things. This is Simon Levin's uh, idea. So I'm gonna run this movie here. So in this case here, we just have a white landscape. Uh, the Jeeps are sitting on this white landscape. There's no, all the genes are turned on here, RGB, and it's on a white landscape. But they're consuming the, the uh, environment underneath. You'll see the shadows develop. And uh, they don't like that. So they'll move away from their own shadows. They're afraid of their own shadows. And they also don't like being near other Jeeps because when they get together, they start to consume more stuff, which is a bad thing too. So they intrinsically repel one another. So I'll run this movie here. And what's going on here now? That looks like a gas of robots, and you can see the shadows they create. Uh, and, and we also, of course, made recovery to the, to the resources. But what we're doing here is we're slowly shrinking the diameter of the circle. So what's happening now is uh, it looks like a gas at the start, but the uh, black background, their shadows, are starting to overlap more and more. And I don't know whether you can predict what will happen here. Uh, uh, Simon knew what was going to happen here. You'll see they will actually freeze into a lattice. They actually crystallize because they don't want to be near one another. So there's basically a repulsive force. So you see the crystallization going on here right now. So now they've crystallized into a, into a lattice, but we're continuing to shrink it. And you might imagine what's going to happen now is that as they get even more compressed, then the background becomes more uniformly black and the gradient becomes weaker and weaker. So you might not be surprised to find out this is actually undergoing a, a solid, the liquid, phase transition and they will become a liquid again. And then as we even compress it even further, it becomes uniformly black, they freeze in place and they become a glass. So you see the four states of matter actually uh, emerging in this system. Uh, because of time, I won't let you, uh, well, this thing keeps on going, but trust me, that's the data. Uh, here's a nice picture of that. So at, at, at very dilute robot concentrations, they basically repel one another. They look like a gas. 
and the Fourier transform of their positions, it looks like what you'd expect, just a uniform ball, and there's a boundary that's a circle there at the center. But as you continue to compress them down to a critical concentration, they freeze into a crystal. That's why you see those rings there that occur in B3, because they now form a, a, a crystalline lattice. Continue to compress it even further, they melt into a liquid, and you can see them at the crystal liquid. Now you lose that uh, um, uh, separation of them. And finally, when you get down to a very high concentrations, then there are glass. You see the glass transition occurring then, too, with these robots. Okay, so uh, we could do a lot of stuff with that, but uh, you know uh, that's not why I'm doing this. I actually want to go into living systems, uh, and we built these things with genes and mutations and stuff. So obviously, we want to look at evolution and adaptation in a dynamic fitness landscape with our robots. Uh, and so uh, I'll show you. Those. So we can do all sorts of games. Uh, this one here is uh, three colors, uh, RGB, and it's going to spin a circle. I just run it for a little bit. You'll see they'll wander around. So the, the uh, color that you see associated with a robot corresponds to the gene that's expressing. For instance, that one down there at the bottom uh, left, which is red, really would like to go over towards red light, and he's stuck in a blue area. He's not particularly happy, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll just run this for a little bit, and you can see them moving around and trying to find a better place but the, the pinwheel is actually rotating at the same time. And uh, here I'm gonna run this same movie, only now you can see the shadows that they create uh, as they chew up resources. I like this, it's still kind of eerie looking sight. Uh, so you see the dynamics of the uh, consumption of the resources that's simultaneously occurring uh, as the pinwheel uh, rotates, okay. So let's, here's an experiment. Let's, um, we're gonna watch this. What's going on here is the one circle and the circle is gonna slowly change color uh, from red to green to blue. We're gonna start out with half of the Jeeps being dead and half of them are alive, but it's possible to have transfiguration here. So we're gonna see the way this whole population of uh, Jeeps evolves versus time as the resource environment changes underneath their feet. So we fire it off. You can see them moving around. There's a certain uh, recovery time to them. You can see the dead ones look black, but occasionally you'll see one lights up, uh, lucky enough to have some sex, uh, uh, or, or that's the uh, one way, but also you can actually be, uh, be brought back to life. And so uh, you'll see the color is changing, and you'll also see that the Jeeps themselves are changing too, that their genes are changing in response to the changing environment. So you see a lot of population dynamics going on here as, as this happens. Uh, we can sort of analyze this sort of thing. So as you might expect, if you have no mutations and no transfiguration, well, that means when you're dead, you're dead. You're always gonna have a chance of going into a bad place because the environment's changing. If you don't adapt quickly enough, you're dead, you're dead. And so that's that red triangle thing. So with time, if we don't have mutations and transfiguration, the population dies out and every robot becomes dead. Uh, we can turn on transfiguration, which means that you can be dead and come back to life again. But if you don't have mutations, that still doesn't work. So that's the purple stars. You still have death going on. If you have mutations and no transfiguration, in other words, no sex, then you still go extinct, but at a slower rate. And then when you turn on mutations and transfiguration, then you can actually have these oscillating populations. And they actually oscillate. They, as the, the period is changing, we see the populations of the red and the green populations of the Jeeps as they adapt to this changing environment has the same power spectrum as the underlying uh, fitness landscape. Uh, maybe that's not surprising, but it's fun to see that happen. We think there's a sort of a critical transition, by the way, but we're not quite sure about that sudden step between mutation and no transfiguration and mutation and tr transfiguration. But like the rest of us, uh, COVID-19 hit us just when we were getting ready to do these experiments. And as you know, China completely shut down at that point. Okay, so that's, but we want to go to really truly complex dynamics. So uh, something more complicated than this circle, which is simply rotating around in colors. 
So we, uh, we created a stochastic, fragmented, complex landscape. Uh, so we made it as complicated as we could. We allow the Jeeps to mutate and transfigure when dead, since we know that it's a necessary condition for community survival. But we vary the resource recovery time here. In other words, we're, we're allowing them to have sex, we're allowing them to mutate, but we're, we're changing how fast the environment can recover once a Jeep sucks resources out from it. So that's clearly of relevance to patchy dynamics and evolution of species resilience as resources are depleted and replaced. Okay, as you might expect, if the resource recovery rate is zero, all the Jeeps have to die, even with mutations and breeding because they're chewing everything up. And as the recovery rate increases, complete extinction still occurs, even with finite resource recovery rate. So there's a critical rate in which the resources have to be replaced in order to maintain a population that is um, self-sustaining. So I think I'll run this movie here. I see this one here is um, a very slow recovery of resources. That means they make big black shadows. And while we started out with half of them alive and half of them dead, they have mutations, they can have sex, they can have transfiguration, but if the rate of resource recovery is too slow, everybody dies eventually. And you'll see that now we'll be left after a while with only one Jeep still moving around. He's very lonely, of course. He can't do anything though, that's his problem, because he, he can't have sex with anybody because everybody's dead. That's sort of useless. And mutations really don't help him that much other than to keep alive, but he's sort of doomed to the extinction, Lonesome George. Um, now I'm gonna show you what happens as we make the, the uh, resource recovery rate faster. Oop, start it off. And you see now actually you can see the shadows aren't as dark as they were before. And if you track this versus time, you'll find out that now you actually have a self-sustaining population. And the number of dead and the number of lives more or less stays the same at 50% self-sustaining, even though the environment is very complicated, you can see it there, and it's changing. If you watch, you'll see those patterns are moving around, but they're able to adapt and evolve in response to the changing landscape, as long as the resource recovery rate is sufficiently high. And so we can sort of map that out. If you have no relaxation, in other words, the environment always immediately replaces itself, obviously what's gonna happen with time is all the Jeeps are gonna become alive. And that's that green uh, stars rising up slowly. Um, if the relaxation rate is a given rate, something, you'll see we have a self-sustaining population which doesn't. But if you drop below some critical number for relaxation rate recovery, then the population simply go extinct. That's the purple one. And for, for, for infinite relaxation time, in other words, they never recover, you go dead almost immediately. So you can see the way the, uh, in this complex landscape, it's very sensitive to how quickly your environment can change. So, so with this paper is uh, in review with uh, a journal you've never heard of, Nature Electronics, for the past two months. Um, but anyways, in the meantime, uh, we've been playing around with what's the next step after doing this. Um, so I decided it would really be cool to see if we can see emergent intelligence in these things, which sounds completely insane, of course. And here's the way that works. So we want to develop a truly distributed uh, uh, computation among these uh, among the Jeeps. And uh, We've been working on this for two years and there's been some amazing technological developments that have happened that are completely changing the way these uh, Jeeps can be made. One is you probably know the iBook, the Mac uh, iPad Pro has LiDAR in it right now. It actually has a LiDAR flight chip set, which you can get for like around 50 bucks. I said 100, but it's actually cheaper. That means our Jeeps can actually scan the environment and get a 3D image of the other Jeeps in the environment. Right now, they only see local neighbors. But with the LiDAR, they can actually look around quite a bit further than they can with this picosecond scanning LiDAR technology. Another thing that's happened is that flash memories have just dropped exponentially in price and capacity. It's very easy to get for under $100, one terabyte flash memories that are the size of your thumbnail. Our present ones had one kilobyte of memory. We can put a terabyte in these things. 
at, at trivial cost. So it's trivial to add massive memory to our robots now. The another thing that's happened is that we now have the development of a new standard for Bluetooth. It's called Bluetooth Mesh. It has a 50 meter range and each one of these little modules, uh, which is on each Jeep, uh, can act as a repeater. It can receive data uh, with over 10,922 nodes asynchronously. So in other words, these Jeeps not only can have massive memories and have LiDAR, but they also can be communicating with all the other Jeeps in real time. And the range of this, of this, of this uh, Bluetooth is over 50 meters. And it broadcasts the MAC address so they even know who they are. And so you can create now networks of information transfer uh, of various kinds, very complex. So not only can the, can the resource landscape be quite complicated, but also the communication network now can be quite complicated too. And that can also evolve in time. And all the Jeeps could be simultaneously communicating with all the other ones if they so desire or not. So the Mark II robots, which we're starting to build now, will be able to utilize uh, massive memories as experience to update neural networks. So we're gonna build a neural networks onto these, onto these chips. And they're gonna update the mapping of the neural network combinations depending upon not only what they've learned, but what other Jeeps have transferred to them. So the other Jeeps, as they move over this landscape, will communicate what's going on. It's a little bit like what's going on with COVID-19. Well, I would call that a, a meme, which is transferring information. So the mapping is a meme, I call it. So we'll have deep reinforcement learning and maybe neural net architecture searching. The robot community can create history-dependent collective behavior. And that'll be much more rich and diverse and complicated due to the sheer scope of possible combinatorics which is just enormous in this kind of a system. That'll be a critical feature of our Mark II robots. And this is not expensive, and this is a technology that's in our hands right now. It's there. So we're going to have these guys moving over these uh, resource landscapes, but they'll also be exchanging information to each other as memes over large distances. They'll have memory storage, which is enormous, which will have a, they will know where they've been and what happened to them. And they'll be able to send messages out to other ones, uh, telling them what happened to them. And that can influence the way they move. The hardware now is influenced by the memes and, and the uh, landscape that they are moving on and over the other ones are moving on. So what we're gonna do now is that we're gonna create a, a virtual reality. Uh, which in other words, the, each robot will uh, construct what it thinks is what the environment actually looks like based upon its own measurements and history and what the other ones are telling it through this Bluetooth network. The virtual reality with them use inputs for the robots, neural networks, which control the output decision. Where do you want to go? Uh, and you actually know which one is which. So you actually know who's telling what information to each other. Uh, the robots keep sending information that contributes to the gain of rewards for a robot will have greater weight. So they actually, the robots can decide who they want to listen to and who they don't want to listen to. So in other words, this virtual reality now will each robot will have a picture inside of it that is not only the local environment that it's on, but what other robots told it and what happened to them. And they will share those computational results. Uh, and we'll have uh, 100 terabytes of memory running, uh, all of them node connected to every one of them. We have another, and they'll be all talking to one another. So we don't know the extent to which the Mark II community of interconnected breeding, mem exchanging, autonomous robots will truly develop a self consistent culture, which is successfully able to adapt quickly to a complex changing stress landscape. I don't believe anything like this has been attempted before. However, the technology is well within reach now to try this kind of thing. And uh, that's all I had to say, folks. Okay. Any uh, Bob, Bob, this is uh, Dave Toronto. I'm gonna ask you a question about the first part uh, and when you were yeah, Dave, talking about. All right, what do you want to ask, Dave? See, this resource uh, generation rate, uh, and you, you where, where showed- Where are you going? Hmm? What do you want to know? 
I want to know what you what what would happen when you go beyond this coexistence point where you have fifty fifty. Oh, uh, and you I keep, see. What are the what are the experiments? Uh, and, and you keep increasing the resource generation rate. Would these guys get lazy and then you just go back <laughs> to extinction again? I don't. What's, what goes you know on? what this plot here is that what you're talking about? Yeah. I mean, well, these is, guys can't get lazy because they really don't have any minds at all. Uh, question is when they actually start exchanging memes and stuff. Uh -huh. Will they actually, will their, will their phenotype then be adjusted by that? Will they, you know, like your word is lazy. Yeah, right. So they, they realize they're in a good place. Uh, they're a plutocrat, you know, Amazon or whatever, you know, and they don't really have to work to do anything at all. Will they simply stop doing anything? I don't know what's going to evolve here as the system changes. These guys here are... are That sounds so like Darth Vader. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, but uh, am I right that in this experiment, all your jeeps are quote unquote mono dispersed? You get a if you had a binary mixture, would you get something? What are you out? asking, Dave? If your if your mean if your jeeps are all the same, yeah. You know, typically, in other ways, supposing I had two different kinds. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, Dave. Yeah, so we. So the neural networks could actually be heterogeneous. So, the, mm -hmm. so the, the neural network is where the computations are actually being done, the interconnection pathway. So we could make that heterogene heterogeneous. Mm -hmm. We could also make it uh, mutatable, as a, as a matter of fact, too. So the answer is, um, at the start, we're probably going to make them all the same. But there's no reason for that to be that way. Okay. They could certainly be heterogeneous. Uh, neural networks. I hope I said that right. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Bob is Herbie. Can I, can I ask you almost a philosophical question? Um, Go ahead, Herbie. So, so, so of course, you're an experimentalist and like gadgets and like these things wandering around. I know what whenever I see something like this, I ask myself the question of, you know, this is an analog simulation. And Correct. so the question is, why is an analog simulation? Why could it be better than a digital simulation of the I same thing? I was waiting for that. Everybody always asks me that. Why are they? Well, of course. Are so, so, so to me, there's only two possible. There's two possible reasons. Maybe you okay. have another one. One reason is it might be that the analog simulation is faster than the digital simulation. That if you build these things, you can create a thousand of them, and you can run this, and it would take and you can discover phenomena that would be too hard to discover in digital. You're not there yet with your Mark one. Maybe you will be at Mark two. I don't know. Yeah, right. I agree with that. Uh, uh, the other is that there could be physical interactions that arise when you instantiate these objects in the real world that were not predictable directly by a, a model of them. Uh, actually, Eshel ben Jacob discovered that he was doing something like this with circuits and discovered that the problem was being solved by straight capacitances that nobody understood. Uh -huh. and so he actually built this thing in the lab. Right. So, uh, so, so, so are you aiming for, for option number one? You're aiming for giving these individuals such great computational and communicative powers that you'll just overwhelm what could be done with a, simu with a digital simulation of this? Well, what is your feeling? Well, that's a great question. That's, uh, yeah, that, so my gut feeling is uh, that option one is certainly going to happen. So, so they're going to asynchronously be communicating with one another via analog uh, procedures. My gut feeling is, as you probably know, that the analog world, which flows in continuous real time, uh, has phenomena that occur that do not occur in the digital world. So I, I think that you will not be able to simulate this system with a computer in any reasonable sort of time frame. That's, that's option one. Option two, I hadn't thought about, and I know about Eschel's work, and that's an interesting, interesting thought, actually. We actually were thinking about letting them wander off my light board and do whatever they want to do, as a matter of fact. Let them go free and or even more complex kinds of environment. So I hadn't thought much about option two yet. Okay. But I think Thank option you. one is certainly a possibility that this will show phenomena that don't occur on in any digital simulation. Okay, I mean, so. Go ahead, Herb. Thanks. I just want okay, to know your opinion. Okay. I said it was a philosophical question. It doesn't, you know, it requires a philosophical answer, which you gave. So thanks. Okay. Well, hope is not philosophical, by the way. You know, it's it's like water. Yeah. You know, the Navier-Stokes equation. You know. <laughs> 
we can't simulate it on a computer very well at all. And, and nonetheless, in the right, analog, no, no, I understand. Analog simulations can be faster, as you said. It's yeah, faster right. to pour a glass of water down the drain than it is to simulate it. Uh, right. But uh, the question is, uh, you know, you're, you're, so you will probably get there with your Mark II, is I guess. Uh, we'll you, see. Yeah. yeah. Hope so. Yeah, and this is Dan Goldman uh, weighing yeah. in here. Uh, hi. The other, uh, the kind of a corollary to that is that, you know, as soon as they go off a uh, perfectly flat light sheet whiteboard type surface yep. and into more complex environments, we just can't model that at all. Not, right. Not at It'll all. just be, become impossible. To, yeah. Right. right. Like, I don't know how to model grass or, you know, in any reason or leaf litter. And, you know, these are the things that the real critters are digging around. Well, yeah, but, but he's, but, but you see, the, but Bob has an advantage over you, which is that you're trying to model real world things and he's trying to create rules that he's created. So once you're creating right. rules, then you know what the model is, at least what you think we created. So, so you don't have to learn what the rules are in the real world, you're creating the rules. So that's sure. why you can run it as digital simulation, at least the first part for sure. Uh, the second, you know, as you get the more sophisticated things, I think there are possibilities where that's just not going to work. But uh... no, no, I think that's exactly it. You cannot actually, you know, if his environment were a little more complicated than the uh, than the current landscape, you could not simulate it. You could not run a digital model of it. That's the other. That's kind of the the easy version of this. Uh, you just can't. We don't have the models of the world for many things. Which is a weird thing to say. Great. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today for the talks. Um, the next Paul's faculty seminar will be at the end of June. Um, I know we already have someone, a Harvard faculty member, who will be speaking, and we need one more to recruit. Um, but that'll come soon. And uh, keep checking your email for updates about the annual meeting. Um, we will have, I will have an email out to you all tonight or tomorrow. And uh, I think that's about it. Hey, Dan, uh, well, I hope you're still there. Um, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, so Dan, well, one thing that is not clear to me even during our previous meeting was how long are these talks scheduled for? Uh, 10 to noon each day. I know, Monday no, but each duration of each talk. Oh, well, I think between, you know, probably 10, 10 plus two minutes. Huh? 10 to 10 12. Plus two. Yeah, 10 plus two, kind of APS style. Okay, all right, got it, thanks. Yeah. Two per node. Sorry, exactly. man. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ciao. See ya. All right, well, thanks everybody. Thank you. Um, Margie, may, yeah. I talk, may I talk to you for a minute? Um, have you seen my email? Um, probably. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, so so uh, Susan told me that uh, uh, she want me to give a like a presentation, poster presentation of the uh, um, yes summary. But but we're gonna change it. So what we want instead, what we're gonna do instead is just have a regular. If you can just prepare a regular poster, okay. um, and then as and save it as a PDF. We're gonna oh. have an on a virtual poster session. So you don't have to worry about recording anything or you know recording a video of a talk or anything. We're just going to do a, a virtual poster session. Okay. Okay. I see. Thank you. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Great. Bye. Bye.